So thank you everyone for joining this afternoon for our wellbeing webinar, uh, which is obviously looking at employee mental wellbeing and what we do now. So obviously we've all been through a very challenging time during the last five, six months. So this webinar is going to explore how we can support our staff, obviously the position that you guys are in as supervisors or senior managers or equally you could be self-employed. So we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail. Just a little bit of an introduction uh, about myself. So my name is Colin Rouse and I'm one of the board of directors at Changing Minds Kent. Um, just a little bit of a background about my skill set and, and what I do. So I worked for Fanet District Council for 14 and a bit years in a, in a nice part of the council. So my role was working in the sports development team. Um, so my skill set predominantly is, is developing sports projects, um, liaising with community sports programmes um, and obviously implementing different wellbeing projects, primarily supporting disadvantaged communities. Um, I wear a few hats so as well as my role with Change in Minds Kent, which is more about the community and the corporate wellbeing side of things. Um, I'm also a, a freelance uh, mental health first aid trainer. Um, so I do a lot of training with a sports charity called Street Games um, and also do a lot of corporate wellbeing support workshops and training as well. So it's quite a lot, lot kind of in terms of my skill set. Um, this is a really good webinar for me. Um, when I was at Fanny District Council, workplace wellbeing is quite close to my heart. So being there for 14 or so, year, 14 or so years, we experience our fair share of challenges, not only from residents, but equally in terms of colleagues and dealing with different departments. And it can cause a lot of anxiety for some people. Um, so for me, I'm passionate about this topic and obviously wellbeing in general. Um, so about 10 years ago, I had quite a big panic attack at work in the, at the Winter Gardens, funny enough. So I remember sat there in a row and for me, the whole wave of physical symptoms just took over from me. and. I kind of assessed my working conditions and how it impacted my kind of my well-being as such. There was no particular triggers at the time. Um, so for me, I reassessed kind of things in my life, uh, working patterns, you know, not trying to burn out or spin too many plates and such. So this is something I'm really, really passionate about. And again, the role that Changing Minds Kent plays in supporting corporate organisations is something we're really passionate about. So before we start, I'm going to introduce a couple of my colleagues. Um, first, I'm just going to bring James Selsby in just to give us a, a little introduction and background into James's role. And then we'll bring Tom in, who's our, our lead uh, trainee today, trainer today for this webinar. So over to you, James. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's James. I, um, I'm one of the directors also at Changing Minds Kent. Um, I've uh, basically worked all my working life in health and social care and have a background through education in um, psychology and sociology. Um, I've sat on a senior management team for a different organisation for the last um, five or six years um, where my passion around um, employee wellbeing um, and um, sort of corporate structures has really, really grown. So um, like Colin and like Tom, we're really passionate about employee wellbeing and what organisations can do to look after their staff and get the best out of their staff and keep everyone well. So that's a little bit about me and I'll pass you on to Tom and his capable hands. Big hands. <laughs> Thanks, James. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Tom Jeffs. Um, I'm hoping you can see me. At the minute, well, I can see Colin. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so there I am. Um, yeah, so my name's uh, Tom Jeffs. Um, I'm also uh, Changing Minds Kent, and I've worked in mental health for the last 20 years. Changing Minds, um, I've been uh, doing that uh, as well for the last uh, three years, um, and I've always worked in mental health. It's really uh, it's been my uh, my thing, my kind of bag. Um, I'm quite passionate about mental health for personal and, and professional reasons. Now, um, I'm hoping you can all see um, our slides that we're going to be running through today. Um, we're going to be looking at employee mental well-being. What do we do now? Because, of course, we are living in a COVID world and, and there are big impacts, I'm sure you'd agree, on, on our workplaces and on, on people's uh, mental well-being. So I'm going to run through these slides. Um, what you will find, just, just uh, for some of you who come in late, um, um, apart from me, Colin and James, everyone's muted. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, we've got a chat function. So you'll find that at the bottom. Um, feel free to um, say hello in there. And or if you have a burning question, Colin is going to be monitoring that um, through the presentation. And um, he, he'll, um, he'll be more than happy just to interrupt me and say, we've got a question here. Um, and I don't mind that if you throw the question in. Um, and at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Um, um, so um, either during or after, whatever. Um, 
Um, so employee, employee mental wellbeing, what do we do now? Um, well, I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Change Your Minds Kent. Um, so we are a non-profit organisation. We're based in Kent. We've been running for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, we, we predominantly do two things. One is we, we, um, we look at uh, getting grants. We get money in to do charitable type projects in the community to improve local wellbeing. So we've got that arm. Um, and Colin does a lot of work um, with that and with the different projects and he will tell us a little bit more about that later. The other arm which we're going to be mainly talking about today is this employee wellbeing program. Now the reason why I've got both of these up um, is because there is a bit of a harmony between the two. The, the employee wellbeing program, um, because we're non-profit, um, um, the employee wellbeing program does actually um, look to support um, community projects. If you know the, the profits that come out of um, this particular program do go towards pr promoting local community projects and and then in turn um, these community projects provide social value for us and the businesses that we're kind of partnering with so, and that's good businesses then kind of look to use that um, for uh, kind of marketing to their kind of customers showing they they do value the, the local community they do value their employees so I've put that in there just so you sort of understand the link between the, the community and the employee wellbeing program. Okay, so um, slide here, who contends with poor mental health and how can we tell? Um, this is something I like to do off the bat really because there is, there are some people who um, can be a little bit, uh, a little bit of a myth really that, that only certain people have uh, mental health problems. Um, this, this, Public Health England survey from last year, so this is before COVID, and revealed that more than eight in ten people have experienced early signs of poor mental health in the last 12 months, including anxiety, feeling stressed, having low mood, and trouble sleeping. So that's the vast majority of people. And I, um, I was speaking um, before COVID to uh, a number of, uh, I think it was a big hall of estate agents, and I asked them, like, is is there anyone here that's not in that eight out of 10? Um, and no one put their hands up. I mean, I do think I was, I was sort of playing a little bit on, you know, peer pressure. I don't think anyone wants to be the person to put their hand up to say, no, I'm, I don't have any stress um, with all their managers and stuff watching. But um, it was interesting, you know, that this is a problem for all of us to one degree or another. You know, if, if you haven't been anxious, stressed or low mood or trouble sleeping uh, in the last few months, then you are obviously doing very well and we'd like to hear from you, find out what you're doing. <laughs> um, okay, so, so this is a problem for all of us. Um, but now what, what about COVID? What impact has COVID had? Well, this is just, I'm just going to briefly show you some stats from the Office of National Statistics. They've done a study, which only came out a number of weeks ago, which showed <laughs> that um, basically um, symptoms of depression have doubled um, during the COVID period. Um, and one in five, um, now experiencing that at the moment, or certainly in June when they took that snapshot. Um, and it's not just um, doubling with lots of people with mild depression. You'll see there the second point is that this a good proportion of that is moderate to severe depression symptoms. And, and, and finally, this third point is really interesting because this might kind of relate to yourself or the workplace. Um, many people think that depression and anxiety are two different, different things. Um, the reality is that although a, a doctor may diagnose you with a form of depression or a type of anxiety disorder, one of the most common, uh, commonly um, diagnosed disorders um, that, a, that a GP will um, give someone is mixed anxiety and depression. Like as if depression wasn't bad enough, like you've also got anxiety. And this is what people are, are saying that they're experiencing. Not only is it low mood, but there's a feeling of being overwhelmed a feeling of, of stress and anxiety and that they're all kind of mixed together and, uh, uh, and rear their ugly heads in a very different um, amounts. So um, that's interesting. Um, it's not just depression, it's not just anxiety, but it's a mix of all those things. Uh, maybe we can just see how um, different people are affected. Um, so this is straight out of the um, Office of National Statistics from a couple of weeks ago. You'll see this is basically a measure of the prevalence of moderate to severe symptoms of depression. Um, the light blue is where we were before COVID. The dark blue is where we are now. So what you'll see is that the top two there, that there are people in work, either key worker or non-key worker, 
the, the, the prevalence has tripled. Um, not so much in the retired and non-working, it was already very high um, depression um, stats for those not working. The interesting thing about this, um, I did a poll on LinkedIn the other day, and it's interesting that um, people, people aren't quite recognizing this tripling effect um, and when it comes to the prevalence of depressive symptoms. And I think that's because when people look around, they just assume people are okay. Um, people can be very good at presenting well um, at work because they have to present well at work, but um, they don't really know what's going on underneath. And, and to give you an illustration, it's a little bit like looking at a car and it looks nice and shiny and clean. You go, oh yeah, it looks all right, but it hasn't had an MOT in years. Like, you know, the cam belt's gone, the brakes have gone. And until you actually kind of get in there with people, you don't actually know where people are really at. So I would ask you, you sort of think about your workplaces. Don't make the assumption that just because someone's smiling that they're, they're okay. Because what the stats here are showing is that people aren't okay at the minute. Mm. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Colin. Yeah, no, just a key point. I think uh, we, we spoke earlier, Tom, didn't we, very heavily about some of the, the organisations that we support. And I think some organisations are different from all shapes and sizes. So you might work in a small team of four or five and actually you've got good team continuity and, and everybody, everything's going well. But, you know, you might work for a larger organisation where actually there's different teams and departments and it's a little bit separate. But just to kind of reiterate, every, every workplace and every organisation is different from size to, to teams to kind of how, how that environment is. Um, very quickly, I had, I had a personal friend who works for quite a large organisation. Um, he's been struggling really, really badly um, with a lot of personal stuff outside of the work and hasn't been really been getting a lot of support within the workplace. So if you think you spend most of your waking hours at work, um, you know, trying to earn a living, trying to make sure that we're hitting those targets, you've got all that stuff equally happening on the outside as well. Um, but he's just opened up saying, you know, I'm really sorry, guys, I've been really struggling and I'm, I'm going to get some help now. So... Yeah, just to reiterate that, that workplaces come in all shapes and sizes and a, the support might have to be catered for a particular organisation. Sure, yeah, okay. So I, I think my takeaway on, on um, um, this is just that um, the, this doubling effect has actually been seen more in, in people who are at work. And this next, um, this next one will show you where um, it's falling heaviest and that's on the 16 to 39 age range. You'll see there there's a tripling of uh, symptoms. So you're sort of thinking about, is the people at work, talking about now younger people at work, that this is affecting the most. And not to say that 70 um, and over and the 40 to 69 age range um, aren't affected, because you can see they obviously are, but it's predominantly sort of being seen in the 16 to 39 um, year age range. Um, and then finally, this is, this is always an interesting one. Um, are men or women affected more? Um, here we've got um, women um, showing uh, more prevalence of uh, moderate severe symptoms. Is that because mental um, women have more mental health problems? Well, um, it's a very complicated picture because, of course, what we find in, and if you ever um, do mental health first aid, there's a kind of stat you'll look at because, of course, um, you would know that um, although men um, might not report um, as much mental health problems, um, they do consume more alcohol, they do use drugs <clears throat> to self-medicate and to mod moderate their mood, and men are three times more likely to complete suicide versus women. So this is a very mixed picture, but what you will see is that both men and women have doubled um, in, in the prevalence of moderate severe symptoms. So this is just a little, like a, a little overview of, kind of what's going on, um, how COVID has impacted um, people, um, and I would say that if this is not chiming quite with what it is that you're seeing at work, what I'd imagine is going on is that there's stuff going on behind closed doors and in people's minds that you're not aware of. So that might be just something to kind of give some thought to. Um, okay, now I just wanted to uh, move on to something a little bit more positive, which would be nice. Um, and it's, um, James or Colin, you got anything to add to the, um, the, the kind of stats we've been looking at? No, but I would just be mindful about how you look at those stats in regards to kind of the difference between men and women being affected. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell a whole picture. Men are, men are generally, um, uh, they talk about their problems just as much as women do, but maybe not with the right people. Um, so statistics are maybe somewhat um, sort of fractured, I suppose, or not, not completely accurate. So not 
not to take it with a pinch of salt, but um, don't read into it too much. Yeah, it, it, it gives it, it paints a bit of a picture, but of course, um, this is always the issue around these kind of studies is that this is kind of self-reported, um, and that it requires that people are actually going to engage with a survey, actually going to report what's going on with them, and of course, that might not always be the case. So um, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, okay, so let's move on to something positive. Um, this is three tips for you now for better when mental well-being. So we um, we have a, a, a YouTube channel with a, a bunch of videos um, that, uh, that I've done which you might find of interest. One of the ones on there is uh, seven things mentally uh, strong people do during the pandemic. And I've just taken a few examples um, of that um, a video just to kind of uh, give you here now. Um, 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 some of the, the, the protective factors when it comes to mental well-being um, are these uh, connection, um, um, meditation and, and avoiding too much news. And, and by connection, um, we are talking about connection of people, um, but we are, we are also talking about connection with um, nature, connection with oneself, and connection with meaningful activity. Um, but um, just to kind of give you guys a, a little bit of a... Um, a tip really I suppose is have a little think about the, the time that you're spending with individuals and the type of conversations that you're having. Um, I, I particularly look to uh, over the COVID period make time to have real conversations. So when I, I'll ask people like how are you um, they'll normally give me a platitude yeah, yeah I'm all right and then I'll ask them yeah but how are you really um, and some people w will like to have a conversation about how they really are um, and I call that a, a level three conversation. And I think those kind of conversations are really important because um, these days, where especially we're spending more time online and, and you know, isolating and what have you, um, people can feel metaphorically lost. Um, they can have this sense of feeling lost. Um, and connection with other people, connection with meaningful activity is a good way to start to ground yourself and sort of give you a sense of direction about where you're going to go. So if you're not feeling great at the minute, I would say like look to kind of reach out to people that care about you. Look, look to try and expand your circle of friends uh, and look to, to ask that type of uh, uh, question of how people really are. Um, one of the other kind of tips is looking at um, meditation and particularly mindfulness. It's one of the things I'm kind of quite interested in. Um, studies from Oxford University show that um, um, mindfulness meditation is as um, powerful as antidepressants in treating um, reoccurrent depression. Um, so there's, there's, uh, there's some interesting um, work that's been done there, especially the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, where they kind of look at individuals and, and uh, how it is um, that they um, um, are thinking. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, quite good. And then finally, avoiding too much news. If you, if you look at the news more than once a day, stop it. Right? It's no good. <laughs> Um, and it's not just the news, but it's also like I think like social media, it's like like keeping up with people. Um, it's really important, you know, that you I may, maybe you've heard of this doom scrolling, where you're just kind of going through a Facebook feed or Instagram feed, and you just like hypnotic zombie. Um, that's doom scrolling. Doom scrolling is not good for you. Try and avoid that if you can. Um, so you know, have a little think about what you're putting into your mind, what you're feeding your mind, um, and um, um, if you're feeding yourself too much, you might find yourself becoming, um, and it, here's another phrase for you, you might come across this, um, you might become intoxicated. That, that is to say that you're intoxicated with too much information, intoxication. And if you're intoxicated, what you'll find is that you start to withdraw because you just have too much stimulation and that'll start to get in the way of relationship, start missing things with people around you. So just three little tips there. Um, if, uh, if you want more, check out the, the video. Um, we've got some videos on YouTube. We just try to change the mind's tent. Um, hopefully it'll come up. Um, if not, let ask us, we'll give you a link. Um, so what about um, improving our workplaces? Sorry, Colin, do you have anything to add to that before I move on? No, it's fine. I just, I'm just gonna say I've added the, um, the change of minds. So I'll add the link in shortly. But yeah, just kind of touching on the connection one, Tom. So just another tip as well, if you, with my sports hat on, 
if you've got a particular team meeting or you might be doing a bigger regional meeting via Zoom or, or anything like that, or you might be doing a socially distanced meeting, something you could try is something called connection tennis. We all love a bit of Wimbledon, right? So it's all, it's all about trying to find out. So this is a perfect one for a Monday morning. So you might have a Zoom call, but try and find out what uh, a colleague has done or what they've, if they've taken a long walk through the woods or on the beach, and then try and build a connection from the conversations within that room. Because what you find when everyone's quite busy, you'll find the phones are on the desk. People are quite, quite distracted by actually being in the moment and connecting with the people in the room. So uh, connection tennis, Tom, that's a really good one. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, so tips for improving well-being in the workplace. <clears throat> uh, the first one, strategy. Now, I think it's really important to have a strategy. I was reading in the HR press just the other day an example of a large business who... Um, they, they like the idea of doing some sort of like employee well-being and they decided, this is a few years ago, they decided to do like a smoking cessation um, sort of drive um, and they spent a load of money, um, did a big launch and um, it was an absolute failure. Uh, and when the, the, the board are asking, you know, what, like what happened? Um, they worked out that they didn't actually have very, very many people in the business that actually smoked. Um, so I think that goes... It illustrates um, quite well the importance of actually um, taking stock of where you're actually at, what's actually going on in your organisation. Um, and there's lots of ways you can do that. Um, and to do that before you have some sort of um, um, phased introduction um, of kind of well-being support for individuals. And then I think it's also quite important, you know, once you've, once you've um, put something together and you've introduced something to people, um, that you actually measure the impact as well. So um, that's strategy, um, and it's important you kind of get that right, otherwise it's possible to waste the money really, I suppose. Um, uh, it's important that you really want to kind of direct um, your strategy in the right places for the right people. Um, so what are the kind of things that you might include in your strategy? Um, training is definitely one of them. Um, um, training, I think, with, certainly with mental health, um, is great for uh, helping people to start to change the conversations they have at work, start to change the culture to make it a little bit more acceptable to talk about uh, mental health. So training is really good for that. And then finally, I would also um, say individual support. If you work in HR, you'll know that there are individuals that you're, you're working with, maybe even at the minute, uh, who, who definitely kind of require a bit of individual support. Um, and you might feel a little bit out of your depth or maybe you don't think you're the right person to engage with them. Um, so having some sort of individual support that's external to your organisation, that can be quite helpful. Um, so this is something, I mean, you know, this is something obviously that we can help you with, but it doesn't have to be with us. Obviously, you can get training and individual support and from anywhere you can put together your own strategy. But if you'd like um, um, some support with strategy um, and some ideas of like training that could be brought in or, or individual support that could be brought in, that is something um, that we can. Um, can do anything you want to add to that colin james before i move on uh no from my side that's absolutely fine yeah just the strategy side of things again is is, is obviously really pivotal i think the statistics i think it's just under 50 percent of organizations haven't got a, a well-being strategy or, or policy or framework so it's really important that like any any corporate document or policy or strategy that you you have one for your well-being um it's a massive, it's a massive boost in terms of boosting that staff productivity and just showing as an employer that you, you are inv investing in your staff wellbeing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I just want to um, um, move on and just to kind of talk about some of the things that um, we are um, offering here at Change of Minds Kent, which might be of uh, interest to you. So um, we, um, both me and Colin, are mental health first aid trainers. Um, so we cover quite a few of the mental health first aid training. Uh, course at Tweet, so um, and this is just on. This is not just physical, but online as well. Um, so we will cover the two day. The two day is really good if you if you're looking to have some individuals in your organisation who are well-being champions. So the two day course for them, it's always good to have someone in you know each department maybe. Um, that's that sort of that's the idea behind that. The one day is quite good for line managers to give them a few skills about how to kind of interact with people, and then there's a half day. Um, that mental health first aid do, um, which is kind of good. Um, they call it mental health aware. So it's about making, starting to change the conversation with um, individuals in the business. 
Um, so not only do we do the mental health first aid um, training courses um, for Mental Health First Aid England, we also have a, a number of um, CPD workshops. Uh, again, like a half day one, improving well-being, that's quite good for, for staff. Um, but then we've got some one day workshops, resilient skills, it's more of an advanced one for managers and, and well-being champions, managing stress, a little bit more of a basic one day uh, um, workshop mindfulness for professionals mental health managers so there's, there's a few kind of courses there which that we offer that which may link in or, or resonate with you as, as a possible uh, thing that you're interested in um, and of course we talk about the the consultancy working with you in your organization i think it's really important that we understand um you know what the issues are uh, so that we can help sort of um, guide you um, and, and um, so that's something that we're, we're able to kind of offer to talk about help with uh, using certain well-being measures and there's a lot of well-being measures out there some are better than others uh, and um, some are good at um, um, using in the workplace i just want to point out this this last little point here the research um, which showed that for every one pound invested in workplace mental health interventions organizations see a return on investment of between one pound fifty and nine pound um, now this return investment you'll see in lots of different ways um, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's interesting. There's a there's a wide range, and I think that kind of shows that some businesses are switched on to having staff, um, and others aren't. Um, and so there could be a whole number of hidden costs for an organisation um, when um, they don't have anything in place. So um, it's uh, it's not all about spending money. It's also about kind of saving money elsewhere and creating kind of efficiencies where you're working. Um, so what are the benefits um, that that organisations who do this type of work um, have well um, I think I would say this there's, there's an increased awareness around mental health as an issue which then increases increases the confidence that people have in talking about it, especially line managers and that in turn starts to change the culture start to change the conversation that people have people start to feel a bit more supported um, and that leads to improved organizational well-being um, improved peer support now this is quite interesting that um, when it comes to the, the the organization maybe as a manager or hr you might sort of feel like is it my responsibility to kind of look after everyone's well-being well like maybe to a certain degree but the, the person that's best to take responsibility for their well-being is the individual themselves and maybe their the the people around them so if we can if we can train those individuals to look after themselves better and look after the people around them then that's that's what we want from a business point of view sure we might be able to do a little bit of one-to-one -one work with some individuals, but we really want people to look after themselves better. And that this is what this is what this is about. Um, so improved peer support, that's looking after one another, which then leads to less presenteeism, less absenteeism, improved productivity, lower staff turnover, and less disruption due to health. So um, what's really interesting, I mean, you, you you guys might have come across this type of research that um, GPs are finding that they they're treating a lot of physical health problems that actually have a, a, an origin with mental health issues. Um, so people are going to the doctor with back problems, but it's actually tension from stress. Um, mm. there, there are all sorts of like issues with um, um, gastro issues, which are kind of reflection of stress. Um, so it's really interesting that, that, that that's what's going on. And of course, these are all the ways that you end up end up losing money or becoming less efficient as an organization in business and these things are going on so this is where the saving is it's in lots of little areas you know having less staff turnover means you, you know you, you've got to advertise less you have less interviews you keep people in the right place things are more efficient and um, anything you want to add to that colin maybe well, I, th I think yeah i think you've you've pretty much summarized it there so obviously there's there's like i said having a, having a well-being strategy is going to obviously enhance and improve obviously productivity which just obviously we've mentioned but again i think the most important thing with this one is culture and i said at the beginning of the webinar that i was a part of an organization for a very long time and within those 14 years the, the environment or the culture didn't really change um even with the, the evolving technology and new members joining the team and the organization so like most of you probably know, but it's really important to get the culture right. And if you can get the culture right, your staff are going to be feel more, feel more valued and it's going to really enhance that well-being. So, yeah, absolutely spot on some of those points. Okay, yeah, excellent. Um, okay, um, this is one of the other things that we're kind of, which is a little bit different from other kind of um, employee assistant programs. 
um, is individual support. So um, this has been quite interesting with some of the businesses we've worked with. This is about keeping the best people well. So what you'll find is that sometimes, certainly as a HR manager or as a manager, you have individuals that you're not really too sure about how it is that you can help. You know there's an issue, maybe they want some help. Um, and so what we offer is the, the ability to assess that referred individual and then plug them in with either people that we employ directly or the people that we work with, which can include counsellors, psychotherapists, um, life coaches, positive psychology coaching, uh, physiotherapists, personal trainers, nutritionists, mindfulness coach. I'm, I'm, I do the mindfulness coach a bit and a little bit of life coaching. Um, and um, that's really kind of helpful for kind of doing some one-to-one -one stuff. Um, and um, also um, our partners have told us some of the business that we do work with, they, they like the fact that we get these individuals to um, give them some feedback. And that's not always easy when you're, you're doing counseling <coughs> psychotherapy because of course there is like um, confidentiality issues. But um, what we kind of look at is trying to co-produce something for the business so that the, the, the individual and the, the um, professional try and have something that they're happy to communicate back to the business to sort of say, look, maybe we could do something a bit different here. Not to say the business is going to do that particular thing, but um, it, it, you know, some businesses, they'd like to have some, some ideas. Um, now, the benefits of this individual support um, are probably obvious to you, like keeping key people well, with reduction in turnover, the maintenance of their networks, relationships that they have, their, their shortcuts that they've developed over the years that are working. And one of the other things that's, uh, that's of interest is this idea of reduction in legal risk. Um, when people, when some people at work um, start to have some poor mental well-being, sometimes it presents itself with um, the, that individual believing that the problem is not with them, but with the organisation that they're working with. And not to say that like all, no organisation is perfect, like everyone can improve, but um, they particularly sort of feel like it's everyone else. Um, and um, what we've found is that there is some sort of benefit in actually offering individuals this kind of one-to-one -one support because when it comes to individuals either in, involving the union rep um, or, you know, making some sort of claim of constructive dismissal, um, it doesn't always look good to the, the, the claim when you've actually spent some money on one-to-one -one support um, for that individual. And, and um, some, of our, um, some of our associates have got some good kind of... Um, um, experience in working in that kind of legal field uh, as far as um, dealing with those types of issues in order to try and like, bring the two parties together and try and get a good outcome for, for both people. Um, so um, to a certain extent, you know, a change in mind um, employee or associate is able, we, we have a, like a, an independent objectivity that's a little bit easier for us to say stuff that you as a manager or a HR might be a little bit like, well, I don't want to sort of say that, but that's what I think is going on. It's easy for us to kind of ask those questions and explore that with them because we don't have the agenda, um, whereas you, you might be seen as having an agenda. So that's another kind of benefit. Um, anything you want to add, uh, Colin James, to that? No, not, not James. James. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, not really. I Just um, sort of echo the points really about... Um, the organisations that we're already doing work with are very keen on kind of the feedback process mm. um, because of, of essentially going back a couple of slides, it's based on a lot of, a lot of the issues that companies are um, and organisations are facing is a lack of confidence about how to deal with mental health problems and how to deal with mental well-being. Um, and through and through the work that we've done so far, we give confidence back to organisations about how to um, work with individuals and really develop them. Um, and also it will touch on kind of what Thomas said about um, uh, the, uh, the issues around uh, the legal process in dismissals and, and um, personal uh, employee performances and stuff like that but yeah it's really goes back to kind of confidence levels of organizations to be able to deal with the issues that they face um, with the employees that they've got and, and, and really try to do the best thing a lot of the, a lot of the issues that we see are is purely just down to a lack of confidence in organizations about how to deal with particular issues and if 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 employers can get over those confidence issues, then it will really benefit the well-being of the organisation. So yeah, that's really just sort of to add on that, really. Yeah. 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 Good point. 
Um, maybe finally, I can just take a look at this because it's just to kind of remind you all that um, Change Your Minds Kent is a non for profit organization. And um, so, you know, I suppose we're saying they work with us to help support the local community. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to ask Colin. Um, 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 along this lines of profits of people, you know, what kind of projects and stuff, change of minds are running. So this is in the other arm. This is, this is if you work with us, you know, profits from these kind of services go in. Uh, and this is, these are the type of kind of projects that we're you know, currently running. Do you want to give us a, 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 a minute or so on that, Colin? Yeah, sure. Tom. So as I said, the, obviously this webinar is looking at the corporate support, but obviously we all work in workplaces and we all go back home to a local community. So the, the kind of ethos here is really that we all live in an environment, we all live in a particular community, but a lot of communities can have their particular issues or health inequalities and, and obviously the situations that we need to improve. So part of the CMK social value is about giving that support to local communities. So we obviously do this work across the whole of Kent. So just looking at the screen below, some of our key partners, obviously KCC, um, we've been fortunate to receive some funding via Kent Sport and Physical Activity Service to run a, a project called Fit and Fed, which is predominantly supporting vulnerable families that may have a, a fairly low income, but equally struggle to put food on the table, which again leads to poor mental and physical wellbeing. Um, street Games there, the bottom right, this is a massive national sports charity again. I sa it sounds like we do a lot of sports stuff here, Tom, but we don't. <laughs> um, but again, it's just looking at the, the huge benefits that actually um, so street games are a huge partner. They receive uh, anything in excess of 10 to 20 million um, from Sport England. But the whole idea is how we can support vulnerable young people and vulnerable communities. Um, so the last six months we've, we've done you know, quite well, uh, working with multiple different partners, um, essentially, as I said, to try and help and support people with both mental health and physical well-being. Um, so again, any work we do from the corporate side is reinvested back into the community. Um, right in saying, I can't remember what you, you were telling me um, the other day, but uh, one of the things that we had to run recently because of COVID was a, um, a food bank. Um, yeah. And um, we kind of worked with a number of restaurants and partners and stuff. We had food and we actually, what, how many people did we, or how many packages did we get out? So, yeah, so we launched a project, launched, excuse the pun, we launched a project called the Lifeboat Project, which um, again was a response due to COVID to support uh, individuals that were isolated or shielding and just families that needed that additional support. So we provided around two and a half thousand food parcels um, across predominantly East Kent, so Thanet, Canterbury, Dover. Um, and it was fantastic. So again, the whole idea is that we can work with these families and funnel, funnel them into different activities that we're delivering on the ground. Mm. Um, very briefly, we've got a social inclusion centre as well. So that's based in East Kent, down in Westgate, um, just down the road from Margate. Um, and it's fantastic. So again, the community work, you know, if you live in a more deprived area, you're two to three times more likely to have a mental health issue. So it's really important our role that we can continue to support the communities that those individuals that wake up in the morning and, and drive to work or go to work have got the support and equally got the support for their families to thrive and prosper. Yeah, good. Um, okay. Um, let me just look at this last slide here. Oh, here we go. Um, <laughs> tea. So I, I like tea. Um, James likes coffee. And Colin, do you like tea or coffee? Or probably both. Um, I like an espresso when I'm dealing with my son, uh, but yeah, I like, I like a, nice, a nice skinny latte. <laughs> okay. uh, and we all like a conversation. So um, if you want to have a conversation with us um, about this um, from a non-obligation point of view, just about what's kind of going on, um, maybe what for you a few ideas and give us an email or give us a call um, and uh, maybe we can have a conversation. Maybe we might be able to do some work together. Um, now, um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm expecting a flood of questions. <laughs> it's, never, it's always the case that people like, no one really knows what to ask, but um, if there are some questions, put them on the chat um, function. Um, Colin's gonna um, read them out and then maybe between me, Colin and James, we'll try and answer those questions if we can. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. So just a few things coming in. Nathan's up for a coffee. That's fantastic, Nathan. We'll, we'll get your details. Um, thank you, Charmaine. That's brilliant. Coffee anytime. I've got one, pri one, one question that's coming privately, Tom, if you can answer this one, or, or James. Um, so we've got uh, an individual that said, how can I manage the well-being of my staff remotely? Um, they said, I worry that this could increase their anxiety and anxiety myself. So I suppose, yeah, worried about the anxiety of their staff still working remotely and not going into the workplace, Tom. 
Yeah, um, what I say, I think the um, um, one of the kind of um, good things about mental health first aid, um, that especially the um, where we've done it in organisations with managers, um, I think they've found that that's given them the confidence to have those conversations about, you know, to actually ask people how they really are. And, and in that um, in that training, um, um, we look at, um, you know, how is it you can have that type of conversation? And more importantly, like what, what, you know, what kind of listening skills you can employ, what kind of questions you can employ. And also where to, where to signpost people. Because I think sometimes managers don't want to ask the question because they almost don't know what to do. Like, what do I say if the person's really struggling? Then what do I do? I better just not ask the question and hope they sort it out themselves. Of course, that's never going to be a good option. But if you've done the training, you sort of realise that you know, you've got some resources, you've got some places where you can actually refer people, um, there are kind of helplines and there's, there's different kind of stuff. Then I think having that conversation, even if it's over Zoom, where you may, maybe on a weekly basis, you're kind of checking with people for five, 10 minutes, going, you know, how are you? How are you really? Like, what's really going on with you? Um, so you're not going to be so scared if you actually get a, an honest answer. That is, oh, I'm really doing it well. Um, and then you I think, um, yeah, I, I, I would really say sort of a, a really good strategy and sort of the, uh, the bread and butter of your work whilst working remotely with individuals is, is keeping up to date on, and keeping your contact up um, with individuals if you can do it on a daily basis with teams or you can do it every week or as much as you possibly can just touching base with people because um and we've experienced it in the office uh, in the offices that we have is that where people would walk along the corridors or be in the same room working with each other and then they would just have a little knit and natter over the tv uh, over the monitor or just knocking on the door to see how each other are or just um, doing those sorts of things, but I'd really recommend just trying to drop in with people as much as you possibly can over the over the periods where you're um, disconnected because you're not at offices. So remote just conversations, set up Zoom quizzes that take half an hour. You just really have to embed kind of contact with each other um, as much as you possibly can, um, and that 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 should help support people's just general well-being um, and then maybe some things in private conversations aside to that over zoom or uh, or other um, video conferencing systems will kind of um, start coming out and you'll be able to sort of flesh some ideas out with individuals and that but I would definitely say kind of consistency of contact with individuals is key fantastic Brilliant. I've got another message that's come in, maybe for James for this one. Um, this is talking about, so let me just get the individual. So yeah, this is talking about, obviously there's been a lot of changes due to the impact of COVID. Um, where we've had to make some tough decisions regarding contracts and hours of pay and, and working hours throughout the week. How do we support the well-being and productivity of our staff in this instance? So I suppose, James, if their hours have been cut or there's been a lot of issues... Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a million dollar That's question. Nice, nice tough question for you, James. Pardon? <laughs> nice tough question for you. Yeah, that is a tough question. Um, I so Sorry I to put you on the spot, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that is a, it's a really good question. And I, I, I think giving people, being open and transparent with people and, and giving people the opportunity to understand what's going on uh, within the business and the impact that, COVID is having on your business or the businesses that you're you're working for or managing um it i think transparency gives obviously people are going to go through stages um uh, of grief i suppose when things are taken away from them or there's change and, and, and you're going to have to go through a process of change management with people but in the initial period just honesty and transparency as much as you possibly can um it would be the first thing that I would possibly do just because uh, I suppose you owe it to them. Um, and you, it's never, you're never going to make those sorts of changes go down well every time, but you can certainly by being honest, transparent and giving people a full picture of what's going on, not just from an organizational point of view, from, but from a, like a social point of view and society point of view about the impact COVID's having, um, that would be my sort of primary um, objective with individuals going through that process. So I hope that helps. But good question. <laughs> Thanks, James. I 
think that's all we've got in that's come in for, from the five questions. Um, I think I think your um your microphone's not working properly, Colin. I can see I can see your mouth moving. <laughs> can you hear me now? That's it, better, yeah. There we go. That's unfortunate for you. You can hear me now. <laughs> and that's all the questions we've had privately from the private conversations. So back over to you, Tom, for that one. Yeah, uh, there's only one one last question um, and from from uh, Charmaine, who's asking how is how is your mental well-being? And maybe we'll, maybe we'll finish on that. Um, Colin, how is your mental well-being? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm probably a good seven, I'd say a strong seven out of 10 at the moment. Um, yeah, pretty busy at work. I'm, I'm grateful, obviously. I think a, a lot of people have been in a much more difficult situation. Um, so I'm grateful that I'm still fortunate to be, to be doing what I love. Um, family are well, I'm well. So yeah, I'm feeling positive. Feeling good. Good. Good, James. Thank you. <laughs> How's your um, uh, but, yeah, I'm very well at the moment. Um, I, I must admit, I've had a very, I had a very challenging start to the year um, with my own mental well-being, but um, I got through that, and I've, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well, so what, everything's what, a okay at the minute. I'm just going to quickly ask a question off the bat here, James. But what would you put that improvement down to? Pardon, sorry. What would you put that improvement down to? Just out of interest. Um. Well. I went vegan at the start of the year, and I think my diet, I think diet was a huge part, part of that. Um, so I've changed my diet back um, to my original diet with what I was fit and healthy with. So that was a big thing. Um, maybe you were depressed because you weren't eating enough bacon. Maybe, maybe. Um, I've upped, I've upped, yeah. I've upped exercise in different forms. So. Uh, I used to be what they would probably class as a bit of a gym monkey, um, but now I've done. A, I do a lot more sort of cycling, endurance work, which has has really helped and has helped me kind of connect with the outside world um, and actually going out into the into nature, which is something that is really has been an eye opening experience. Not an eye opening, but a very pleasant experience and seeing my local seeing my local area for what it is out in the beautiful countryside. So. Um, Generally speaking, I'm getting more sleep with my child. Um, so my, my two-year-old girl is sleeping better. So that's, the that, that help, that's helped enormously. So, what, what, um, so a, a collection of things. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was kind of picking up on what you were saying there, um, it's, just, it's another kind of little tip really that was in the, the kind of well-being tips. When it comes to improvement of um, like mood, motivation and well-being, um, Unfortunately, exercise is one of like if you could put that in a pill, that would be like a bestseller um, from a pharmaceutical point of view because the, the benefits are so great. Um, so that is one of the other seven um, in the in, in the video. And I know like everyone's like, oh, exercise, I've got to this, that, and the other. But you don't. It doesn't have to be a lot for it to be helpful. You know, just uh, you don't have to be um, doing some sort of high intensity interval training. In order to improve your mood, um, you know, just start with walking um, and see how you get on. So that's just another little kind of thing to put in the back of your mind. There, um, I like walking out on the on the uh, the North Downs. Um, I sometimes even have walking meetings on the North Downs. I go for an hour or so and we have a meeting whilst walking on the North Downs. That's a great way to have a meeting, by the way. Um, so um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, taking the time out to spend um, this little bit of time with us. Um, feel free to uh, to uh, get, in, get in contact if you'd like to further the conversation a bit more. Um, it was nice to um, have you all along. And unless there's any other questions, which I don't think there is, um, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye now.